Let's just start in a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you that we can uh, join together in this way by um, Zoom and just start looking again at the next uh, part of uh, um, being called to be a servant. And Lord, uh, we understand and we know that as Christians, we are called to serve. And uh, But the, the way of ser leadership in the, in the world is completely different to the whole idea of uh, servant leadership. And I pray, Lord, that as we study tonight, uh, we will see some things that maybe we have learned or will learn, or in some things we may need to change even in our own lives, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, it's good to see you all here with us tonight, and uh, some of you see some of you back, and some new ones with us, uh, David and Ray, and uh, Sue was there for a few minutes, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> but we're going to continue looking at the example of Jesus tonight as a servant, and I just want to start off with our, our motto again, hopefully this will work, it's not working now, okay, <laughs> nothing, there it is. This is the servant. We, this is the motto we put up about uh, the whole area of servanthood. A servant is not about making our name known, but about making God's name known. And I know that a lot of people serve to be recognised, but as a Christian, um, we we, we uh, serve not to make our name known, but to make the name of the Lord known. And that has to be our motto. And I just want to reiterate at this moment that, you know, being a true servant is not always easy, as we looked at last week. You know, sometimes it, it can be quite difficult and uh, quite hard. But before we start the new one, I just want us to go through Don't some worry. of the main points from last week. And uh, I don't know why it's not working for this week. Yeah, might. The first thing we looked at is servants do not get caught up in a sense of entitlement, but rather give of themselves sacrificially. We looked at that last week, how it's so important that, you know, um, as a servant, we don't expect everything for us. It's all about giving up for sacri sacrificially. Servants do not merely act a part, but rather as servants to the very core of their being. And that was looking at the whole area of, you know, a lot of people serve but they're doing it for a purpose or a reason. We do it because it's just who we are as Christians, just what we are as servants. Servants are not aloof, but rather empathize and enter into the lives of those they serve. And that was just looking at that whole area of how we've got to enter the people's lives that we're serving and really look at, you know, not, not saying we're better than them, we're not judging them, but we enter into their lives, doesn't matter who they are. They may be the richest person on earth. They may be the poorest person on the earth. doesn't matter. We enter their lives and empathize with them. And, and remember, the, the Bible tells us that weep with those who are weeping and uh, cry with those who, who are crying. Um, so, and uh, I don't know, let's mute that for the moment. Okay. And then the last thing is servants are not self-serving, but rather submissive for the sake of others. So we're not doing, we're not serving just to serve ourselves. We're serving so that other people may uh, uh, learn about the Lord Jesus. Now tonight, I said to you last week, we were going to look at two passages of scripture um, as we consider the example of Jesus as a servant. The problem is the first passage I started has got four verses and I only just finished one verse. So it's going to be a long study tonight. <laughs> no, it's going to, we're going to have to go on to next week for this one. But we want to start off by looking at the idea that uh, Messiah is a servant. So if you've got your Bibles with you, although I've got it up on the, on the screen, I'll have all the verses up on the screen so we're not rushing around the Bible tonight. But if someone could read Isaiah 42, Verses 1 to 4 to start us off, please. Okay, I'll read that. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. 
in his teaching, the islands will put their hope. Okay, so in this, in this four verses, there's nine things we learn about being a servant as a Christian. And uh, tonight we're going to look at the first one. Hopefully the rest won't be as long as this, but the, the first one is a very important one. And the first one is um, servant has the Holy Spirit. Okay. He says, I will put the Lord's, and we've got to understand Isaiah 42 is talking about Jesus as the Messiah. But the example of being a servant is the first thing is he will put his Holy Spirit on him. And I think it's very important that we recognize that the Holy Spirit's not only the author of life within us, but he's also the accomplisher of service through us. Um, the Holy Spirit that imparts spiritual life to us, making us children of God, wants us to uh, communicate this life to others as servants of God. So when he involves us, we are established as children of God. He infills us, empowers, and works through us as we are established. And as we are servants of God, it's all about the Holy Spirit working through us. This is the big difference between a Christian servant and anyone else that serves. All servants are good. Okay, but a lot of people serve, they're good. But the difference between a Christian servant and a, any other servant is the Holy Spirit empowers us. And I don't know, you guys might be different to me, but I don't naturally serve. It's something that comes unnaturally to me. I, I, I tend to look to be served. But when, it, when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, uh, we, we are automatically called to be a servant to God. But a servant to God is, is, is uh, one who's had his life changed by the Holy Spirit. And one of the important things about, about the servant of God the Holy, that the Holy Spirit on is there's only two objectives for the servant of God. The first one is evangelizing the world. As we serve, and, and for those who don't, who have just joined us, you don't have to be quiet. You can, you know, put your hand up or something or because I, I might not hear you and me, yeah, but if you've got something to say, feel free to say it. But the first thing is in, in 2 Corinthians 5.20, it talks about being an ambassador for Christ. To we are evangelizing the world. So that's the salvation of sinners. But also as a servant, and this is where sometimes Christians get a little bit uptight, is that we're there to build up the church as well. So as a servant, in Ephesians 4.16, it talks about building up the church. So as a servant, we don't just serve our, uh, the, the people who are lost in, uh, from God, but we also serve those people in the church. And uh, sometimes it's easier to serve the lost people than it is the Christians in the church, isn't it? Sometimes it tends to be that, you know, we, we tend to uh, have our, I guess, our ideas about people in our churches and we judge them probably more than we judge people outside. So it's very important as a servant, there's these two things that we need to do. Um, and, and it's important to note that if the Holy Spirit is not in the Christian activity, then really we're not doing Christian service at all. Mm. It's just we're doing a good work. And so when we look at service, what's that? Someone True. Oh, okay. Sorry. I didn't. Um, yeah. So, so I'm just trying unmuting Susan. Okay. Um, Okay, then it, and then that, uh, the Holy Spirit is the author and the accomplisher of all true service for God. And every truly born again person is already a servant of God. Okay, so when we become a Christian, it's automatic. The Holy Spirit comes in. What did he come to do? He came to serve Christ, to glorify Christ, to lift up Christ in John chapter uh, 15 to, to 16, 17. It's all about being a servant so every christian is already a servant whether they're practicing that is another thing we don't know but for us here tonight we have to ask ourselves are we actually practicing um this whole area that we are a servant of god so i just thought we'd look at some verses and second corinthians 5 18 to 20 if someone can read that verse Shall I? <laughs> All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ 
and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So notice there, we are, we are Christ's ambassadors. It's talking about us who have been reconciled to him, and therefore we are now the ones who take this message out to reconcile others to God through our service. And another verse that's well known, um, Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Notice always, we are those who have received the Lord Jesus Christ, those who have accepted the Holy Spirit are the servants of God to go out to, to send, get the message out, to make God's name known and to uh, do good works that he has prepared. Now there's five aspects of, um, someone's got a bit of a wind in there, uh, Mike. There's five aspects that, that the Holy Spirit does for us when we, when we are in service. The first thing, he equips us with the gifts for service, okay? Gifts that we receive are not for our own benefit, they're for this gift, for the service of the God. When you think about it, when a soldier goes to battle, he needs equipment. When an ambassador goes to a foreign country, he needs equipment. We all have our natural gifts. I mean, some are great accountants, some are great uh, music players, piano players, um, all that. But for a specific service to which we've been called, the Holy Spirit gives us spiritual gifts to, 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 to take on the world. <coughs> Excuse me. Can anyone quote me Ephesians 6.12? Start it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone get their Bible out. I didn't put this it, one on. Sorry. It's about um, our our warfare. It's about our warfare. Mm, that's right. For our struggles not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Mm -hmm. and, and what I want to bring out there is. As a servant of God, we're not battling the physical, although that may come in sometimes. We're not battling all that. We're, we're actually in a fight, in a spiritual fight. And that's what the gifts of the Spirit are given to us so that we can fight this uh, battle that we're in. And what I noticed as I went through Corinthians, well, it goes through Corinthians 12 to 14. It keeps going on about the gifts that we're given. But there's some things I've noticed particularly in uh this uh, the verses we read in verses four to six we recognize there are a variety of spiritual gifts for our service okay there's a variety of gifts that are given to us so that we may uh, help one another that we can be the ambassadors for christ that we may build each other up and although there we should all encourage there are those who have the real gift of encouragement aren't there although we can all give there are those who can really give they have the gift of giving, and, and it's, it's nothing for them. So we all have this variety of gifts which make up um, the body of Christ. In verse 7, it talks about the fact that we every Christian has some gift, all of us. Okay. Now, some of you may have done networking with uh, uh, Clive in the past. Myself, I did spiritual gifts thing. But the most thing I found, the best way to discover your gift was to go out and do something. And you discovered what God had put in your uh, given you the gift. And, and sometimes that gift was, you know, I found I had the gift of evangelism. And I was able to use that in helping people and, and being able to talk. We, every Christian has a gift. And it's important that we recognize as a servant of God, you have a gift. It may be more than one. It may be just one. But God has given you a gift to battle. In verses 8 to 10, we learn what the gifts are. This, sorry, this is in 1 Corinthians. Um, I dropped my note, sorry. This is in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. Um, no, 12, 4 to 21, sorry. Uh, I, we didn't read that, did I? Sorry about that. 
Uh, but never mind. You can you can read it yourselves because it's a long passage. First Corinthians 12, 4 to 21. It's what happens when you drop your notes. <laughs> Verse 8 to 10, we find out what the gifts are. And not just there, it's in other parts of the Bible as well. In verse 11, oh, that's what it was. We learn that uh, that should be that, that should be. We learn that the Holy Spirit is sovereign in giving his spiritual gifts. And in verse 14, we learn that all the gifts are necessary for a healthy body. So these are all given. He equips us to serve. No believer has all these gifts and no one has any of them apart from the Holy Spirit. So all of us need to serve together. We need to work together in service for the, for the Lord. We are all called to be God's servants, whether it be in whatever area, it may be in the secular world, it may be in the church, wherever you are, you are God's servant. By nature, the fact the Holy Spirit is in you. He has put your Holy Spirit on you to be a servant. And we need to really look at that. Am I really serving uh, for God where I am? Remembering the twofold witness thing? One is to communicate the gospel, and one is to build up the church. Next thing we find about the Holy Spirit is he directs to the area of service. Now, true servants are not self-appointed servants going just where they think they will, you know, they, they'll just go wherever they like. We actually are sent by the Holy Spirit to serve people. So I've got a few examples here. The first one is in Acts 8, 26 to 30. So if someone can read that. You're on mute, Ray. I can't read because my words are going across the picture. I can't see the ends. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, well. So I'm obviously too large. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Can someone read Acts 8, 26 to 30? Dave, can you read yeah, that? I'll read it. Okay. Now, an angel of the Lord sent to Philip, go to the road, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasure of Candate, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. So we're going to stop there. We, we know the story that Philip shared with him and he understood and the unit got baptized. But what I want to point out here is the spirit directed Philip to go to that point. And I don't know if you sometimes you have experienced the prompting of the spirit, whether to call someone or go to someone or it's very important we take notice of those promptings that the Spirit gives us. That comes from the Holy Spirit. That's not, you know, we often say, is that my thought? Is that, you know, do I, am I just imagining that? But when, the, when you're a Christian servant, the Holy Spirit will say, Ray, go to Joe, okay? Or, or Margaret, go and see uh, Kim, or whatever it is. We follow the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know, have you guys ever experienced being prompted to do that yep yep anyone want to share an experience of that a bit on the i know you it's a bit on the on the cuff but if you're open that's fine if not that's fine too I'll, I'll share an experience then, um, just last week. Uh, I just felt the Spirit ask, telling me to ring this person. Didn't know who they were. I saw them in the prayer directory. Didn't know who they were. Um, never met them at church. Uh, I didn't even know if they were at church, but obviously when I, found, when I read them, I found out they were. But I, I kept putting it off and uh, kept coming really strong, this prompting, you need to call these, this couple. So in the end, I called them, and what an amazing conversation we had. Um, they were just going through some struggles at that particular time, 
and they just enjoyed having that conversation. And I'm, I got off the phone really blessed by it. I really got, you know, it was amazing. I think if I hadn't obeyed that calling or that direction of the Holy Spirit, I would have felt different the whole day. And, and we need to realize that the Holy Spirit directs our service. Now, okay, you may have your ministry, um, but sometimes the Lord directs you elsewhere to do something particular. And we need to be open to that. Um, not just say, is this my imagination or is this my own thoughts? Act on it because that's what um, God, the Spirit did to Philip. And in the service, you need to be open to what the Spirit is asking you or where the Spirit is going, asking you to go. Another one, Acts 13, 1 to 4. And uh, Margaret, can you read that, please? Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia, and sailed from there to Cyprus. Once again, we have this um, prompting, not necessarily for Paul on Paul and Barnabas, but by other people around them, saying, "Paul and Barnabas, you should go and go to that area, uh, go to Cyprus, and, and and share the word of God." And sometimes, you know, someone may say to you, Margaret, I think you should go and see um, Barbara. Okay, just something like that, and that can be a prompting of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I have no idea why I say that, um, but obviously the Holy Spirit is, is directing us. And notice the thing here, it was while they were in prayer. So a little bit of an advertisement here, <laughs> our prayer directory that we have. While we're praying through that, if the Lord directs you to particularly go and see someone or to call someone, act upon it because they may need it. Or they may even say, oh, I just need to give this word of encouragement to, to, to Abe, okay? Act upon it. Because the Holy Spirit, as a Christian servant, we need to be willing and ready to hear and obey what the Holy Spirit is prompting us to do. Now, remember this, though. The, prompt, the, the Holy Spirit will not prompt us into doing anything that's sinful. So if that's your prompting, that's not from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that's from our flesh. Okay, but he not only uh, sends us, he also prevents us. So here in Acts 16, 6 to 7, John, can you see the screen? Yes. <coughs> can you read that, please? Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When and they came to the border, the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So there's also, um, there's also this whole idea of the Spirit preventing us from uh, going places or doing things. And sometimes that's a good thing, because sometimes... We get, uh, well, you probably got, you guys don't, but I probably get a bit pig headed. I'm, I'm going to that place there and I'm going to do this. But sometimes the spirit present, prevents us from doing that and it's for our own good. Now, we do not know what would have happened if, if Paul and his companions uh, went on to, to, to um, the, across the border of Messiah. We don't know what would happen. But what we do believe as a servant of God that God will stop us doing these things that are not good. And it's interesting to me, in, when they're in the region of Phrygia and Galatia, they were kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Sometimes, uh, you know, especially as an, as an evangelist, it really grates me when I can't preach the word of God or I can't share the gospel. But when I was reading this uh, and studying this and getting this ready, um, I thought, no, I need to discern whether it's the Holy Spirit stopping me from doing that. It's not the right time or the people aren't ready for it. 
because as, as an evangelist, you always want to get, you know, really get out there and tell people, you know, the sinners and they need to get, need to accept Christ and all that. But the Lord is very clever, isn't he? His Holy Spirit sometimes prevents us from doing that. And we need to be aware of that. But again, uh, a sort of a warning. When uh, is it the Spirit stopping us or is it our own fear stopping us? So that, that's, that's something we need to, to have discernment in. But as a servant of God, remembering our, fir our first nature of, of servanthood is, you know, we want to communicate the message of salvation to sinners. Okay, so, but, so that's our goal. You know, uh, Ray, you're doing CAP. The goal of CAP is to get people out of uh, debt, but the overall goal is to see these people come to serve, see, the, um, see, see, see Christ as their saviour. Margaret, you're, you're serving at the school, helping the, the kids. That's your goal. But your overall goal is how can I lead those people or teachers to the Lord Jesus? Okay, so when we serve, we need to be aware of when God is preventing us and when we're preventing ourselves from sharing the word of God. But that wasn't the only case. Uh, also in Acts 2, 21, 4. Um, Abe, can you see the screen? Yes, I, I can see that one. Oh, you can oh. see that one. Okay, right. You can read that one. We sought out, we sought out the disciples there and stayed with them seven days. <laughs> Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. So once again, we have this prevention, but it's come from other people. Uh, I don't know if you've experienced that. I, I've experienced that when I was heading overseas, right back in the 80s. My whole desire and goal was I was going to go up the Amazon River and I was going to go into the tribes. And I was going to um, work amongst the tribal people in the, in, in the Amazon. The elders didn't think, you know, they sort of, they, they prayed about it. They were supportive, but they didn't think that was the right place for me to go. And as I said, I'm a bit pig-headed and it got me a little bit. <laughs> That's a <surprising. laughs> <laughs> but, but then the Philippines opened up and... I said to the others, I, I'm thinking of going to the Philippines. And they said to me, that's where we believe the Lord would have you. Okay, that was a leadership that was praying about where we were going, what I was doing and where I was going. So sometimes other people will urge, stop us. And we need to listen to that as well. Um, and, and in this case, the people stop, urge Paul. So just something there is when the Spirit, he directs you, be open to his leading. As a servant of God, be open to his leading, be open to his um, stopping you from going somewhere. Uh, you know, just, just be open as a servant. He directs us to the areas of servanthood. Third thing we see with the Spirit's involvement upon us is he anoints us with the power for service. Okay? He's the one that gives us the powers to serve us. So, uh, Avril, can I get you to read? Oh, why have I gone there? I jumped somewhere, have I? No? Okay. What does the power of the Holy Spirit on a servant give? Acts 2, 4. Can you read? Well, let's start off with Acts 1 to 8. I don't know why that's missing on my slides. I put it on there this morning, but never mind. Uh, Abel, can you look up Acts 1, uh, 6 to 8, please? Acts 1, 6 to 8, says, So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has sent by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Hey, what Is do you that notice? It? That, yep, that's the one. Thank you. What do you notice about being a witness? Where does our witness come from? Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. He anoints us to be the witnesses. And I think that's a, you know, I know the Holy Spirit is not talked about a lot in um, our circles. But because, and I understand that's because of the influence of back in the 70s and 80s, 
But it's interesting that, that, that the, the disciples were told to wait until they received the power of the Holy Spirit to be the witnesses. You see, once again, we have this whole idea that we cannot be a witness without, without uh, the Holy Spirit. We need him in our lives. And uh, he's in our, when we become a Christian, we, he's in our lives. We have the full anointing of the Holy Spirit, but at times we don't allow him to work in our lives as we should do. So what does he give us? Well, and uh, someone reads, and if you've got your Bibles there, can you just open up to the book of Acts for the time being? And we're going to go through some verses in the book of Acts and read those. Uh, Sue, are you still with us? Yeah. Yep. Oh, there you are. So, Sue, can I get you to read Acts 2, 4, to chapter 2, verse 4? Just verse 4? Yes, just all of them, for this one. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Okay, what does the power of the Holy Spirit on a servant give? Well, the first thing he gives is the power to speak. Okay, now um, we're not going to get into discussion on the tongues there. My understanding of it is languages in the original language. Okay, and as we read the whole story, you see that people were hearing their own language as the, the apostles, uh, as the disciples uh, spoke. But he gives us the power to speak. Now, can anyone remember a verse that Jesus said to the disciples about speaking? Yeah. Do not worry about what you will say in front of kings, but he who will come upon you will give you the words to say. Okay? Mm. And I think often, uh, and, and if you knew me before I was a Christian, you would know I didn't speak very much. In fact, I hardly spoke at all. Um, my, my biggest sentence was, hmm. That was probably my biggest sentence. When someone <laughs> asked me a question, I'd be, hmm. And that. So I never really spoke that much. But when I became a Christian, the Holy Spirit turned that around, and now people wish I would shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Making up for lost time. Yeah, that's, well, that's, that's what I tell them, yeah. <laughs> But it's the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to speak. And, you know, and, and it gives us that uh, whole idea of discernment when to speak as well, not just the power to speak. And sometimes people need to say, hey, Shane, don't say that yet. Or, you know, perhaps you should have said this differently. But it's the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to speak. And uh, who's A2D1? Not answering. Okay. What's that? Who's that? Didn't hear what you said. Oh, can, can, okay, Ray. Um, have you got your Bible there, Ray? Well, I got my phone, but I'm in Acts. Don't ask me to go too far around. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, John, are you there? Yep. Yep. Okay. Can you read Acts 413, please? Four thirteen. Oh, okay, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> now I've lost it. <laughs> you missed out. <laughs> you missed out this time, Ray. Next time. <laughs> when you find it, Ray, this is what it says: When they saw the carriage of Peter and John and realised that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Okay, so the, the next thing I, I, I ascertain here, that the Spirit gives us not just the power to speak, but the power to speak fearlessly, to, to, to proclaim the gospel fearlessly, despite, you know, when they look at Peter and John, the courage he ha they had uh, to, to share the word of God, to, to, to preach when they were being told not to, uh, when they were threatened with prison, when they were threatened with um, all the stuff they continued to preach the word of God, and that comes from the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know if I, I've spoken with so many people this week, I don't know if I said it here, but I don't know if you realize that last week when the Taliban took over Afghanistan, they lined up this row of pastors. Now, I think it was 22 pastors, Christian pastors who had at the, the, the church who were underground church there. The Taliban had sought them out, found them, and lined them up, and were going to shoot them. They had to say that Jesus was not Lord. 
but they didn't. They stood and they fearlessly spoke up and said, Jesus is Lord. And that's that whole idea of speaking fearlessly. Sometimes our fear takes over, doesn't it? When it comes to speaking about Christ. Um, and and our, like I said, we've got to discern, is that the Spirit stopping us or is it our fear stopping us? Because the Holy Spirit gives us that ability to speak fearlessly about Jesus Christ. Well, what was uh, the end of that love... story? What's that? What was the end of the story you were telling us about? the? Did they get killed? Yeah, they shot them all. All right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I don't know. If you, yeah, um, I just can't remember the name of the, the station at the moment, but there's a, there's a night, uh, um, every week we have these um, iPod messages come through and the lady was interviewing Pastor X, who was from Afghanistan, who was over there and got out and was telling us about what they went through over there. So sometimes if you get the opportunity, I'll, I'll see if I can find it when it come, next one comes in and sends you the link of that. But, yeah. but they had this idea of speaking fearlessly. And I think we need to speak fearlessly. You know, people are fearless when they speak about uh, anti-vaccine or vaccine or lockdown or anti-lockdown. They're really fearless or about land issues or that. But when it comes to Christ, you know, where's the fearlessness that we need to speak about our Lord Jesus. And that is what the Holy Spirit, that's what the power uh, of the Holy Spirit does to us, gives us that power to speak fearlessly. And in fact, uh, I remember in Colossians, and I didn't think of this earlier, but uh, you get an extra here. In Colossians, Paul said, pray that I may open my mouth boldly to witness or to share the gospel. Eh? And I think that's something we need to pray. Um, you know, in a time of, in, in our world where Christianity is often considered um, too far to the right, although we don't consider that, but that's how people see us because we of our stand. We need to have that power to speak fearlessly about the Lord Jesus. Okay, Ray, are you in Acts still? Yep, yep. Okay, Acts chapter 5, verses 3 to 4. Right. But Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land while it remained unsold? Did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not your, at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Okay. Right. Yep, that's the one. And, and as a servant of God, you need the power of the Holy Spirit to discern the true from the false. Now, I don't know about you, but I know Ray and I have often spoken to people and you sit there thinking, that just doesn't sound right. There's something amiss there. Something's left out. Something's underlined. And I often find that in counseling too. While you're talking to people, you get this sense that this isn't right. There's something missing there. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. It's not our intu intuition or anything like that. So as a Christian servant, the Holy Spirit gives us the power to discern the true from the false. And I guess uh, for myself, I, that was something that I learned a lot in the Philippines because, um, and, and since I've been back in New Zealand, people only give their side of a story. And you always need to really discern what's going on here. Why is it that person's been kicked out of the house? You know, because I'll say it's all, you know, the other person's fault that this has happened. So it's very interesting. You know, um, here is the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Fire, and Peter had the discernment to know what they're saying is, is, is lies. How did he have that? The Holy Spirit had put it upon him. And I think as a servant of God, when we're serving God, the Holy Spirit will give us the power to discern uh, the truth to uh, from the false and be aware of that if you're a servant of God which we all are we are servants of God be aware when God is prompting you something's not right here dig deeper to get once you get to the deeper part then you can share the gospel or, or correct things but while people are just giving out just what they want you to hear you will never be able to share the gospel with truth with them so so dig deeper Okay, uh, we haven't read for a while. Um, Dave, 
X5, 12 to 16. X5, chapter 12, chapter 12, verse 12. Now, yep, many 12, signs. Verse 12 to 16, yeah. Yeah, okay. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's porch. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And the more than ever believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that even. They even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Okay, so I'm not going to get into the what was happening. What I want to bring out here is that a servant had the power to give needed help. Okay. Paul, Peter and the disciples, they, they performed these signs, but they, they were giving out help. And one of the things we need as a servant is, you know, really be on the side of helping other people in need. Now, we may not be able to uh, heal the people that sick, but we can help them. And for me, the greatest miracle is in that help, we get to share the gospel with them. So the servant gives, the Holy Spirit gives us the power to give needed help. It may be a food, it may be budgeting, it may be just an encouraging word. It doesn't matter what it is, but we have the power to give. And, and yes, yeah, sometimes through the Holy Spirit, we're directed to pray for someone to get well. And they do, okay? That's God's will and always will be God's will. It's not on our demand. We can't demand God to heal someone, but we can ask God to if it's his will to heal someone. And we've seen that. Even here in the church, we've seen that. In the Philippines, we've seen it. The Holy Spirit sometimes says, pray for this person, give them the help they needed, which is healing. And that may be a miracle. Yes. Well, so because the road up past Shays has been blocked for years. What was that, Dave? David's on the phone. He's on the telephone. Oh, oh okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I scared him off. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we need we need to be willing to give as a servant we need to give help when we can and yeah there'll be times when we're taken for a ride but that hey it? that's fine as a servant of the lord we we give help when we need it and the power of the holy spirit directs us now we have people coming in for food banks and that and we sit down and talk with them and the one you're talking to them you, know, you sometimes i'll see if i can mute dave for the moment yeah. <laughs> Yep, he's muted. Okay. <laughs> so sometimes you, you just discern, you know, yeah, this person really needs a big helping hand. Sometimes you discern, this person's just taking us for a ride, so you don't give as much. But we do give help as needed. And it may mean that sometimes you have to take out of your own day. Sometimes it may have to take out of your own schedule. Sometimes you have to say, well, look, I won't be there because I'm helping this person. You know, these, these sorts of things, but it's the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to give needed help. Uh, who we got? Susan, you read Acts chapter 5, verses 20 to 29. And do it. Hold on. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the, official, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were puzzled, wondering what would come of this. Then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. 
Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. Thank you. Now it worked and now it's not working again, huh, Shay? Okay, let's go back to the... Okay. Power to obey God regardless of the consequences. Uh, this is what the Holy Spirit gives us, the power to obey God regardless of the, the consequences. And I've really highlighted that last verse there. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather um, than human beings. David, I put you on mute, so you can unmute now. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah that's okay. Had a business call coming. Yeah, no, it's fine. And, and sometimes, <clears throat> you know, again, this is the power of God, to, uh, Holy Spirit, that helps us obey. Because honestly, we can't, we struggle to obey God at times when, when we, we, we fear the consequences. But I love what Paul says here. We would must obey God rather than human beings. And just on that, I just thought of another verse that I, I'll read to you, which is a really powerful verse. It's also Paul. And he says this, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Mm, that's yeah. Galatians 1.10. What a powerful verse that is. Is our service to please man or is it to please God? And, you know, when we, when we go out and serve, you know, it's all good in that, but is our whole purpose to please the pastor, please the elders, please the uh, whoever, or is it I do this because I please God? God gives us the power to obey. Mm. Okay. Uh, Avril, are you still with us? Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, can you read Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7? In those days, when the number of disciples were increasing, the, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the he Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Porcherus, Nakana, Timon, Thaminus, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So there's a lot in this, these verses, but one of the things I want to draw out here that comes up is the Holy Spirit power, gives us the power to do first things first. What's most important to be done? And I love the fact that, you know, when you look at this, it sort of reinforces what was said in Isaiah about the Holy Spirit being on the servant. They didn't just go out and look for anybody to look after the Jew, the, the uh, um, Hellenistic Jews. They looked for people who were filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that tell us again? The servant is filled with the Holy Spirit. We, we are servants. And, and when we choose people to do things, we shouldn't just look at their talents and their gifts. We should ask the question, are they filled with the Holy Spirit? And uh, the apostles prayed for this group and they went out and did a tremendous job because they, they were obeying the Holy Spirit. But what I want to draw out is the Holy Spirit gives us the power to do the first things first. What is necessary for me to do right now in service of the Lord? There's lots of things to do. Okay, look, You look at our ministries in the church. We've got rally, we've got uh, cafe, we've got ignite, we've got music, we've got 
cups of morning tea. We've got women's. There's so many sad things. What is the Holy Spirit calling you to serve at? You know, and it may be in your job where you are. That may be his calling to you. Okay, and saying, look, I want you to serve those children, uh, Susan, or, or, or David, I want you to serve those guys you're working around because they don't know Christ. We, you know, and, and that may become more important than actually maybe doing a rally class or something. I'm not saying don't do that, but, you know, it may become more important. It may be important, more important to take a budgeting class than it is to come to cafe. See, the Holy Spirit directs us to what is the first things first? What is the necessary that I have to do? Because uh, as a servant, we want to be open to what the Holy Spirit wants us to do at all times. Being a Christian servant does not mean just doing everything. Okay, I'll, I'll go to church on Sunday, I'll, I'll set up, I'll make the cups of tea, I'll serve the people after morning tea, I'll go out and do the visitation, then on Monday morning I'll, I'll come in and I'll do the, the ladies group, and then on, on Monday night I'll, I'll do the, the equip class, and on Tuesday morning I'll go to main meeting. doesn't mean you do everything. The Holy Spirit says, Dave, I want you to do this. Margaret, I want you to do this. And there may be two or three things that you're doing, which is great. But it gives us the power to, to, to discern what is the most important thing to do for me at the moment for God. Um, so, Ray, are you still with us, Ray? Pardon? Yep, there you are. Oh, I thought, I'm only getting six pictures. Not everybody's on. I can't see oh. everybody. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so Ray's cap. Okay, so that is his most, um, that's where God's put him. So that's what he's got. A, he's serving God in that area. <clears throat> and that becomes the most important thing because that is, the, uh, um, the the service that he's put on him. Okay. Uh, who hasn't read for a while? John, can you read Acts 6, uh, verse 8, please? Acts 6, 8. Now, Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Okay. This is going to be a controversial one, this one. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to perform miracles. And he does. Um, it may be the miracle of salvation. It may be the fact that you prayed for someone and they got better. It may be the fact that you prayed for a situation and it improved. You know, <laughs> we always look at the miracles as something as someone miraculously healed. But I, I don't just think that's miracles. You know, the miracle of someone being safe, the miracle of someone being saved. So you've got safe and saved, the miracle of perhaps someone getting better from uh, cancer or something like that. But it is through the servant of God. Okay, this happens not, not through outside sources. It's through the servant of God who is empowered with the Holy Spirit. What did he say in 42? The Spirit will be upon my servant. And this is one of the powers we have uh, to, to be able to, talk to people to be able to pray with people to be able to just pray for their situation and i don't know um, if any of you have uh, examples of this where you've prayed about a certain situation and it's turned out um, better than you expected or you've prayed and I, I i think of some of the situations we got into the philippines they didn't turn out how i expected them to do but sometimes they did um, God took a, took a turn on that and, and he took it. But we do have that power. But I don't think it's always the power to, to heal. And that's what's focused on now in, 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 our, in our Christianity brothers and sisters. It's all about healing, but it's not. It's about the ability to, to pray for situations, it's about the ability to speak about the Lord Jesus, about the ability to see people come to salvation and for me that is and maybe i'm a little bit biased as evangelist but to see someone come to christ is the greatest miracle there ever is when someone admits they're a sinner and turns from that and accepts the lord jesus as their lord and savior and transforms their lives that is the greatest miracle you can ever see and i think you know <clears throat> i think often um jesus performed a lot of miracles but when he said you follow me because of what i've done not because of who i am a lot of people have left him, if you remember those verses in the Gospels. And uh, I think, you know, those who continue to follow him, and of course, we've got to recognize the apostles at this time had an amazing 
you know, there was amazing things happening at that time to just uh, see great things. And it, it was in order to, to prove to people that this Jesus was real mm. and that different groups would see, well, this, this Jesus that, that these boys, these guys, these people are following is a real God. Because, you know, often in the old, in, in, the, in the Bible, they'd have all these other gods expect and uh, offer all these things right up to the children cows and all that nothing would happen here comes these guys who proclaim the name of jesus in a society that was full of gods um, um idols and their gods does amazing things so it was a it was a sign to show to these people that man this is a real god this is true god but for us today i think it's more about the whole area of the miraculous sa salvation that we have Okay, uh, who hasn't read for a while? Um, who we got here still? No. David. Yeah. Dave, can you read verses, chapter 6, verses 9 to 10? 9 and 10? Yep. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians and those from Cilicia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Anyone guess what I'm talking about here? Power to speak with wisdom. Um, I, it always amazes me when you sit down and talk with people and you start talking to them and they come up with all these things and you come out with these nuggets of things that you don't know where it's come from. And it answers specifically the problem or the, the, the question or what that person's doing. That is the power of the Holy Spirit giving us wisdom to speak. Um, so I think it's really important as a, as a Christian, we maintain that relationship with our lord so that the holy spirit as ephesians says we are filled with the spirit so we have wisdom to speak at the right times mm -hmm. um, sometimes wisdom says be quiet and sometimes wisdom says speak up louder but we've got to have that wisdom to know when to speak we've got to have the wisdom to know what to say and and i know you know a lot of wisdom comes from the bible as you're reading the bible you get to know who God is and learn more about the Lord. And then as you're speaking to people, the Holy Spirit brings to you these nuggets of wisdom that, you know, you just, you know, I think of Solomon, he, he wasn't a wise man. The Holy Spirit made him a wise man. Okay. And I think that's the same with us. We, we have these nuggets of wisdom, the power to speak with wisdom when we are anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit for service. And every Christian, I, want, I just reiterate this over and over again, Every Christian is anointed with the Holy Spirit and power for service because we are Christian service. Okay. Moving on. We've got, we've got 20 minutes to go. <laughs> okay. First Peter 4.14, I've put up there. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. He sustains in the midst of service and this is one of the great things I've, I've experienced in the middle of service for the lord he keeps you going the holy spirit keeps you going you know you want to give up at times uh, you know, I, I don't know i'm being honest here sometimes you just feel like is it all, or is it all worth it is it really you know should i chuck this person aside and forget about them but the holy spirit um sustains us in that and you know, something that, that I read earlier, that we read earlier, this, uh, our struggle is not against um, flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of the heavenly realm. And as a servant of God, you, we will be exposed to opposition, we will be exposed to dangers, and we will be exposed to persecution. But we've got to remember it, it's not a physical world where we're fighting it's the spiritual world and when you move forward and this is something that you know the more you move forward as a christian the more opposition you will have and we're seeing that more and more now in our day here in new zealand little by little there's more and more opposition to the message of the gospel but that does not mean we stop 
in fact, it means we push for, push harder. We go further. We push harder than what. And one of the things I, I've often said is what happens when, as a result of faithful service, the believer will be persecuted and will suffer hardship. But God gives a special supply of the Spirit to fortify and strengthen the servant. Now, I'm not saying you get more of the Spirit. Excuse okay, me, we've Shane. We've got all of the Spirit. Uh, excuse uh, me, yeah, Shane. Hey, yeah. Shane, excuse me. What is the scripture there, First Peter? Uh, First Peter four fourteen. Sorry. It's Thank just you. About, it's just. The, um, it's just. And it's just hiding. Oh, I said okay. Then. Sorry about that. It's all right. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. Thank you. So when I'm saying God gives a special supply of His Spirit to fortify and strengthen us, I'm not saying you get more of the Spirit. Okay, don't get that. We've got the Spirit. When we became a Christian, we got the Spirit. But I think as you move forward, and as you are facing persecution, the strength of the Spirit becomes more apparent in your life. The the power of the Holy Spirit to continue on becomes more apparent in your life. It's not that He's giving it; it's just that you're allowing God to take more of a, 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 a part of your life. And that's why the persecuted church is often the church that's growing fastest because as they are facing the persecution for preaching the gospel, the power of the spirit is just more apparent in their lives with the strength. You know, uh, we can, here in New Zealand, we could, we could share the gospel, walk away. Uh, you know, in a lot of countries you share the gospel and it's going to cost something. But uh, I believe that as you serve God, and as you serve the Lord, and as you continue on sharing and serving in Christian Christian uh, service, whether it's through bringing uh, the message of salvation to non-Christians or whether it's building up the church, which I, I must, uh, must uh, re-emphasize, that is our role as a Christian servant. It's easy to pull down the other members of our church or, or other churches. It's easy to do that. But as a Christian body, and this including all churches that are Christians, uh, born again Christians, we are in order to build them up. We need to bring them, you know, encourage them and, and, and strengthen them. I think uh, we've seen this already, um, but uh, Ray, are you still an ex? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just one verse. I, I, I like, well, two verses really, I'd like you to read. And it's. Um, uh, Acts 5, 40 to 41. 5, yeah. Verses 40 to 41. Right. And when they had called in, when they had called in the, the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonest for the name. Oh. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease. Yeah. Look at that. Yep, that's good. I mean, you know, in all of that, what was happening in their time, they were persecuted they were flogged they didn't stop they didn't stop preaching or something you know and i love what they say rejoicing because they counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name they were they, they rejoiced in that and i had to ask that question how is that possible uh, yeah there it is how is that possible and there was really one answer by the holy spirit and i, I just as we finish up tonight, there's just three things I want us to look at. So we're still in Acts. Um, Margaret, can you read yep. Acts 7, 54 to 60? Stoning of Stephen. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him. 
dragging him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were still stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Amazing. And Saul was there giving approval to this. Yeah. Isn't it amazing uh, that Stephen went through all this. He continued preaching. And he even asked that, you know, God wouldn't hold their sin against them. How? Well, verse 55, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit. Once again, you see the servant who is full of the Holy Spirit was able to forgive those who were stoning him. Now, I don't know if I could do that, but I pray I would, but I don't know. But, but you know, it's just the example again of a Christian servant full of the Holy Spirit. And uh, in the process of being killed, he's still saying, oh, Lord, forgive them. Don't hold the sin against them. That can only come. For me from the Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, next verse, Acts 16, 22 to 25. Um, I got David. Oh, right. oh, you got it, have you right? Okay. Yeah. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safe safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Verse 25. Oh. And midnight, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Thank you. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison were shaken. Hmm. What I want us to bring out there again, here's Paul and Silas beaten, stripped, flogged, thrown into prison, put in stocks. And what do they do? They sing hymns to God and pray. How? Yeah. By the Holy Spirit. Again, you see, as, as, as a Christian servant, when you're in the service of the Lord, doesn't matter where, what we are serving, when these things happen, we shouldn't get upset by it, but we should be saying, praise the Lord that I have been worthy of suffering this disgrace for God. You know, because we've got to understand as a whole, as, as a Christian servant, you are going to, we are going to come against various different problems and persecutions. It may not be the physical that we get here in New Zealand, uh, in other countries, but here in New Zealand, you may get the rejection, you may get the uh, snide comments. Praise the Lord for that. That comes from, you know, the Holy Spirit will strengthen us in that and keep us strong in the midst of that. And, and just to finish off, the last verse I want us to read is, um, who was going to ask you? Was it you, David, wasn't it? So yep. Romans 8, 25 to 17. Romans 8. Yep, 25 to 17. And when you read it, you'll know the verse. Uh, 20, sorry, 20, sorry 20, 25 to 27. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. No, verse 25. Well, you but, can start there. That, that's where I'm bringing it from anyway, 26. Okay. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. That's where I want to finish tonight, um, because we've only got through the first part of Isaiah 40, 42, but never mind. But this is where I want to finish. The Holy Spirit helps us in our service. He helps us in our weaknesses. And there will be times when we feel really weak in our Christian service. And, and sometimes you can turn away from it. Sometimes it becomes a crisis of faith for us. But if we get down and start praying, even if we're not saying anything, the Holy Spirit will help us through that time. And they, he will pray for us. He will intercede for us. But what is important is that God knows 
the mind of the spirit. The spirit knows the mind of us and our heart for service. And I think it's really important we realize as a Christian service, without the Holy Spirit in us, it's not Christian service. It's just service. Mm. So, so all that we do needs to be about the Holy Spirit being in our lives. As I said in Isaiah 42, 1, a servant has the Holy Spirit. A Christian servant has the Holy Spirit. That's where we'll finish tonight because the next one is another long series one. It'll be next week <clears throat> uh, if you want to come back. But I just think, you know, as we, as we serve, be mindful that it's the Holy Spirit that directs you and guides you and strengthens you. Any comments or any add? Or I'm going to ask uh, John, will you be happy to finish up in prayer in a few minutes? Yep. Now, now we're in a few minutes. Time. In a few minutes. I'll, I'll just ask you. Just say yes. if anyone else has any other comments they would like to add or experiences they've had. So if we're following what we think might be a prompting, and if it's not a prompting, then the spirit will block that anyway. Yes, that's true. I believe that. Yep. Mm. Yeah. But, but if we don't follow it i don't you know uh, you'll never know <laughs> you'll never know and sometimes there's that doubt it stays there was uh, was that from the spirit or not yeah and if that doubt is still there then it probably was from the spirit <laughs> right i was thinking oh, of oh sorry dave go ahead i was thinking of john the baptist when he said he must increase and i must decrease mm. it's kind of a a good bottom line attitude to have towards the service mm. about it's about increasing the lord jesus and not about increasing us it's about decreasing us yep i was thinking that, about that that's going to be our last study <laughs> sorry that will be a, that's going to be on the last study in servanthood oh, <laughs> oh he jumped a cue <laughs> no, but it's good to be reminded of that because that, is, that is in line with the motto right at the beginning, isn't it? Yeah. A servant is not about making our name known, but about making God's name known. Yeah. And I just uh, just really encourage us to, to keep that in mind. When I'm serving God, it's not about me. It's about God. Okay? I want God to be known through me, not me to be known you know, I mean, we all like encouragement. It's not a, we agree with that, okay? We like encouragement. Oh, you're doing a good job in that. But when you, when, you, when it comes down to, um, you know, just, just what we do and why we serve, oh, I, I missed one. Never mind. Um, I'll, just, I'll just share this with you. Uh, I went on my other paper, but... The last thing I saw here was the Holy Spirit does. He's preparing us for an eternity of service. Revelation 22, verse 3. I'll read it because I've got it here. I don't think I have it on my... Oh, I did do it. Hold on. I didn't put it on my notes. So sorry about that. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. Mm. Okay, Revelation we often take a very short view of Christian service. It's while we're here on earth. But, and when we, we imagine or when we die, when the Lord comes, that's the end of our service. Oh no. When we go to heaven and be with the Lord, we will be serving him. This is just a practice run. Okay. And I, I think as part of that, uh, all our service down here is in preparation for service up there. Okay. John, can you lead us in prayer, please? Yes, thank you, Shane. Um, and thank you for your encouraging words tonight. Um, so I'm going to pray in the effect from Isaiah 42. So mm -hmm. let's just say thank you. Father, thank you for your son, our saviour, your great servant, and uh, that he is the one that you have upheld You've chosen, you've delighted in, and you've placed your spirit in him. And now we are his servants and need to serve the same way. Mm -hmm. And Father, you've called us in righteousness. You've taken hold of our hands. You will keep us and you'll make us to be suitable servants for you so that we can be a light for the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Lord, that you do not give your glory to anybody else. And just help us to keep that in mind as we serve you, please. It's all about your glory and not ours. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone, for joining with us tonight. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Shane. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.